morning, church. So I, I, I feel like I shouldn't even get up here after this. I mean, anything I can say pales in comparison with what we just experienced, right? Um, you know, I've, I've, I've said this before, but it bears repeating. Um, you are a precious child of God. Amen. Thank you. No, seriously, if you don't be, believe that, believe it. You. You, you, you are a precious child of God. And it's not just a children's song, but Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. And you know, love is in the air. Um, I know it's not Valentine's Day, so this might seem a little bit out of place, but love is in the air. I've been thinking a lot about love lately. Um, I've been thinking about things that, that, that matter to me, things that I enjoy, things that I love. You want to hear about a few of them? Okay, we well, are going to hear about them anyway. Um, I can't really give you the whole list because then we'd be here all day long, but uh, how about a short list? Yeah? Cool? Okay, all right. So first of all, let's see. Um, I love... Hold on. Coffee. What? Yeah! Here we go. All right. Okay. I love coffee. Um, it doesn't really matter what brand, um, but I love the taste, I love the smell, um, I, I, I love the routine, the ritual of, of you know, going to the kitchen every morning and putting the coffee in the maker, the whole deal. Um, it's, 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 it's nice, it's something I look forward to on a daily basis. I love coffee. Um, oh, okay. Hold on, I have a lot of stuff in here. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I love M&Ms, oh my word. Um, I, I, I honestly think that the Mars company spikes M&Ms with cocaine. Because um, these suckers are addictive, right? I'm telling you, um, but I love these things, I always have. Anybody want this? There you go, right. Yeah, you owe me. That, no, 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 I'm not giving coffee, no, 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 uh-uh, no, all right, nice try though, that's good, okay, <laughs> all right, um, let's see, what else, what else, okay, um, I love books, all right, here, so I love books, I actually just, uh, just finished this book this week, just under a thousand pages long, um, I'm a nerd, uh, it's, it's, it's a great biography of Harry Truman, one of the best books I've ever read, um, now, those of you who have been to my house, you know that I have more books than I could ever read in a lifetime. That's not all of them, by the way. Yeah, there are actually three bookcases over here. There are two behind, one behind there, and one over to my left. And that's not even all of them. <laughs> I think I need to join Celebrate Recovery. What do you think? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, you know, if you need to borrow a book, I probably got it. And my, my wife is a saint. She puts up with me. So, bless you. Thank you. <laughs> um, oh, okay, okay. You know, the thing is, I, 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 I love what I can get out of these. I love, you know, the, the, the knowledge I can get out of books, and, and, and I can share that knowledge with my students, and it makes me feel smarter than I am. Um, I love baseball. Yeah, right? You know, I mean, who doesn't? Especially in summer, right? It's the great American pastime. It's a game that's filled with, with anticipation and athleticism and, and, and beauty, you know, and a lot of history. And this is the year, of course, don't say anything. This is the year, of course, that my beloved angels. Wait, 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 wait. All right. This is the year that my angels, thank you. My angels are going to the World Series, and we are playing. We're going to play the Dodgers, right? Yeah, it's happening this year. So just watch. I'm making a prediction, right? So baseball, baseball, I love it. Um, I'm, I'm of Irish ancestry, and you know what Irish people like. It's not what you think. <laughs> Don't stereotype. Come on. Although there's that. All right. Um, <laughs> I love storytelling. Irish people love storytelling. We are natural-born storytellers. And I love 
modern storytelling through movies, right? Um, you know, I, I, I love the films of Billy Wilder and, and Otto Preminger, um, Oliver Stone's great, great storytelling. I love cinematography. I love you know, the, the acting of Jimmy Stewart. He's amazing, right? Um, I love the improvisational strips of Mike Lee, who did that movie right there, Vera Drake. It's great stuff. I love good storytelling. I love it. Um, I love my dogs, right? I love those little critters. And you know, if you were here last summer and you heard Terry and me speak about dogs, you know how much these little critters are just like deep in my heart. Oh, speaking of uh, Terry and Diana, I love these people. Yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. You know, I mean, what, what would our church be without the spiritual leadership of Terry, right? What would our church be without Diana's chocolate chip cookies? Okay, I'm back. Yeah, there we go. Okay. Oh, all right. Um, hey, I love my mom. Yeah. I love my mom. Yeah. So um, this, this, this past week was her birthday, by the way. So um, wish her a happy birthday after, after church. Uh, she's the one who really instilled in me a lot of, of the values that I, I, I strive to live out. So um, thank you. I love my mom. I love her very much. Um, and she had an awful lot of patience with me as a kid, because God knows she needed it. <laughs> Angel though I was. Okay, all right, okay, okay, all right, all right, all right, fine. fine. Uh, okay, let's see, what else do I have in here? I love music, all right, I love music. Uh, for those of you under the age of 25, this is called a compact disc. <laughs> okay, not too many of you then. All right, uh, it doesn't really matter what it is. If it's good music, I like it. I like 50s doo-wop, I like the Beatles, I like a Mozart concerto, and as my students can tell you from the first day of class, I love jazz. Yeah, Frank Sinatra right here. I mean, just good music, I love good music. I love um, different eclectic expressions of, of emotion. I mean, God has, has given us so many ways to express ourselves through music, and I love that. I love, almost done by the way, I love my country. Yeah? yeah. You know, my country's not perfect, our country's not perfect, but it's the best one we got. And um, I wouldn't really want to live much of any place else. You know, I could stand up here and sing Lee Greenwood songs all day, but that would hurt your ears. There's a reason I'm not on the music team. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. See you get up here, man. All right. <laughs> you guys are a rough crowd today, man. Uh, but so obviously there are a lot of things that I love, um, but but the one thing that, uh, that that's really gotten me on track uh, lately is this. Yeah. So yeah. Rare. It's cute. So if you uh, went into the foyer earlier, you saw something. You know what yesterday was? Yeah. Okay, next one, next one, next one, next one, next one. Yeah. Yesterday was our 10th anniversary. Wedding anniversary. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So, um, love is in the air. You know, I love that woman. She's amazing. I mean, any woman who can put up with me for more than like five, ten minutes, you know, is a saint. Um, well, you didn't laugh at that one. Ouch, okay. <laughs> I, I adore my wife. I love my wife. I love Sylvia. Um, she drives me crazy sometimes, and I know I do that to her, um, but I love her with all my heart. I would do anything for that woman right there. So you don't love. Love, it's a, a four-letter word, the good kind. Okay, tough crowd, man. It's a four-letter word that, uh, that stands for a lot of things, you know, and in English, of course, we use the word love in some strange ways. It's, it's, it's strange in that we have really only one word to convey a whole wide range of emotions. Obviously, you know, I don't love M&Ms the same way that I love Terry and Diana. 
Um, I don't love baseball the same way I love Sylvia. So it's, it's interesting when we talk about loving God. And do we mean that we love God the same way we love our families? Or do we mean that we love God the same way I love my books? You know, I, I, I love my books because I can learn from them. I can benefit from them. I can use them much the same way that I love God. God, right? Benefit from him, use him. But is that really what God is after? You know, I, I was raised a Seventh-day Adventist. I was, you know, I'm a third generation. And I don't know if it was my, my childhood understanding or if it was something my parents instilled in me or if this was handed down from the pulpit in the church I was growing up in. But I grew up thinking that, that the way to show love for God, the right way, the only way, was simply by following the rules, by following the law. You do this, you don't do that, you worship on the right day, of course, you don't eat pork, and you, Brian Plummer, therefore, love the Almighty. Now, I won't, I won't ask for a show of hands here, but um, how many of you who were raised in the church, like I was, um, had that idea? You know, as, as I've gotten older and, and I've, I've read through the Bible several times on my own, and I've, I've read a wide variety of Christian authors from across the centuries, I'm not really convinced that keeping the law is the supreme expression of love for the God who created you and me. I'm not convinced of that. You know, let me put it this way. Um, last week, a week ago yesterday, uh, my family came over to our house to celebrate the 4th of July. Yeah? Yeah, it's kind of cool. We were, we were the most patriotic kids on the block. Uh, we had a blast. My uncle and my friend Van and I, we talked about the state of the world. Um, my, my little cousins, um, we got into a water fight. I lost. I'm old and slow. Uh, we had an amazing spread of food. We watched fireworks in the evening. And, you know, I was grateful for my country. I was waving that little flag, man. It was great. Um, I was thankful for the religious freedom that we have here. I was, I was grateful that there aren't bands of terrorists m marauding through the streets who would kidnap my little 10-year-old cousin and make her a child bride, right? Um, I was thankful that we could complain about the things that we perceive wrong with our government and not worry that we'd be lined up by a wall the next day and shot. I was grateful that I could go to sleep that night, the 4th of July, unafraid. And you know what? Not once on the 4th of July did I think about the laws that made that possible. Not once. And I bet nobody in here did either. I'm going to guess. You know, I, I, I love the ideas that make our country great, the things that are bigger than the laws, the ideas from which those laws came in the first place. That's what matters. You know, you can follow all the laws of the United States down to the letter and still not love this country. Do you realize that? Yeah? I actually saw um, quite a few people like that when I worked for the State Department a few years ago. Good law-abiding citizens who did everything right, but they would not hesitate to spit on the flag and denigrate everything that this country stands for. So, you know, while it's obviously important and it's, it's obviously necessary to obey the laws of the United States, obedience does not equal love. Obedience does not equal patriotism. Right? You with me so far? Cool? All right. Um, tell you what, let's, let, let's put it another way. This right here is what? Well, this is my marriage certificate. Yeah. All right, so um, this states very clearly that according to some guy named Thomas H. Schroer in the state of California, uh, according to the law, I am married to somebody named Sylvia E. Baranov. Yeah? Uh, so legally, according to this piece of paper, I am bound to her. Yeah? Um, so legally, I guess I'm supposed to love her, right? Like it's a burden or something? I have to treat her like a spouse, I guess. 
if I must. I mean, this document's important, right? Yeah, of course it is. Um, the, the, the legal relationship that's established between Sylvia and me is in this piece of paper. But you know what? I never look at this thing. I had to find this the other day. Right? I never look at it. Right? I, don't, I, don't, I don't have to pull this thing out to remind myself that I love that woman sitting right there. I don't have to be reminded of it by this. I don't have to be reminded that I'm madly in love with Sylvia. I don't need a legal document to tell me that. My love for her goes far beyond the law. Now, please do not misunderstand me here, okay? Um, I'm not advocating heresy up here, right? I'm not saying that God's law is not important. That's not my goal today. Yes, God's moral law is in effect. You know this. I know this. It, God's law is, is, is unchanging. It's, it's absolute. We need to follow it, absolutely. But I don't think that whether you eat a ham sandwich or not determines your love for God. Does it? I mean, what is it about the law and our relationship to God? You know, when I read in Scripture... Um, that, that God tells his people what he wants, what he expects, what he demands. He demands obedience to his law, but then it seems, if you read later on, that he, he contradicts himself by saying, I don't want that stuff. I don't want sacrifices. I don't want fasting. I don't want you, you to even you know, honor the Sabbath. I don't want the stuff that's prescribed by law. It seems really confusing. You know, just look at uh, Psalm 40, verse 6, and Psalm 50, uh, 51, verse 16, Jeremiah 6, 20, Hebrews 10, 6 through 8, that's all in your bulletin. All of those passages state very clearly that God is not interested in shows of legality. So what does he want? What does God expect of us? If you read Hosea 6.6, 6, it, it makes it clear that God wants us to practice mercy. Or if you read it in the original Greek, it says he wants us to show love. He wants us to know him. 1 Samuel 15.22 calls for us to obey God's voice, to submit to him. Micah 6.6-8, 6, 6 through 8, like you probably know, calls for us to practice justice, mercy, humility. And Jesus said, in Mark 12, 29 to 31, and you probably know this passage by heart, he said, the most important commandment is this, listen, O Israel. And you could insert North Hills in here. You, you could insert your own name in here. Listen, the Lord our God is the one and only Lord. You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. The second thing you should do is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus says, no other commandment is greater than these. Yeah. There's, there's, there's nothing here about obeying some law code. There's nothing about what you can or cannot do on the Sabbath day. <clears throat> there's nothing there about putting pepperoni on your pizza. Just saying. So what is there? What's Jesus calling for? Supreme love. Nothing is greater in this life than supreme love for God. And I challenge anybody here today to tell me that supreme love starts on Friday at sundown and ends on Saturday at sundown. That's essentially the idea that I got as a kid. You know? The other six days, yeah, you know, you, you shouldn't go around cheating on your taxes. You shouldn't steal gum from the supermarket like I did one time. Uh, you shouldn't fry ants with a magnifying glass. You know, in other words, be good moral people. But essentially, you've got six days to, to go to school, you go to work, you wash the dishes, feed the dog, you mow the lawn, you get some sleep. Six days are ours. One is God's. That is it. That is love. That's not in the Bible. God expects the totality of our lives, not just a portion. And just like my, my marriage certificate uh, doesn't state that I'm Sylvia's husband three days a week, 
The other four are mine. I can do what I want. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, all the time. If we are going to call ourselves Christians, if we are going to call ourselves followers of Jesus Christ, then all of our lives, every aspect, must revolve around him. Our love for God must not be partway, halfway, not even most of the way, but all the way, total, supreme, everything. You with me? Now, you probably know that, right? Just like I, I, I knew that when I was growing up. But, you know, for, for some reason, it, it, it seems overwhelming. Or, or maybe that idea of everything, all supreme total, is, is just so abstract that we don't really know what to do with it. And since we don't really know what to do with that, that idea of everything we revert to the default mode of just giving God ourselves one day a week, paying him lip service the other six, while, of course, not trying to do anything, anything bad. That, you know what that is? I call that avoidance theology, right? <laughs> you know, God does not look at our relationship with him as avoidance. You are close to me only if you don't do A, B, or C, right? Now, some people understand this better than others. I mentioned earlier that I like jazz. Right? Now, I'm not here to give you a lesson in jazz, although I could, um, because it is a great American art form, right? I like talking about jazz in my, in my classes, um, and my students are sick of it. Um, but I want to tell you about a guy for whom this concept of total love, supreme love, clicked. A guy named John Coltrane. That guy right there. John Coltrane. Interesting guy, born in North Carolina, 1926. Uh, he had a pretty tough childhood. His, his parents abandoned him at a young age. Um, he started playing the saxophone as a young age. He joined the Navy at the end of World War II. He played the sax in a Navy band. Um, after he got out of the, the service, he started playing saxophone in different bands in the 1940s and 50s. He ended up playing for one of the great jazz artists of all time, a guy named Miles Davis. Right? Both of them were sheer geniuses when it comes to music. Right? Um, both of these guys, I mean, they, they, they developed their own style of jazz. Um, and Coltrane, he, he lived out what you would typically think of as a Musician's lifestyle, sex, drugs, all the trappings of fame, right? Um, and he was so strung out on, on heroin and booze that finally Miles Davis said, I don't care how brilliant you are, if you're doing smack, you're out of my band, man. He fired him. Miles Davis fired John Coltrane, right? And so um, Coltrane was on this, this, this downward spiral. And so one day in... Um, in 1957, he said later, you know, I hit rock bottom. And I'm going to quote from him, from him here. He said, I experience, by the grace of God, a spiritual awakening, which was to lead me to a richer, fuller, more productive life. Now, he, he still struggled with drugs in the years after that. Um, but after a, a few years, in the early 60s, Col Coltrane said, thankfully now, through the merciful hand of God, I do perceive that I have been fully reinformed of his omnipotence. And it is truly a love supreme. And so from that point on, Coltrane devoted his life. He devoted his whole art, the ability that he recognized that God had given him. He dedicated all of it to honoring God. In his entire life, everything he was all about was to be given over to God. And so the result was, was one of the most amazing pieces of music that has ever been created, what he called his hymn to God. He wrote it in 1964, and it was called A Love Supreme. Right? Um, as I was learning about jazz many years ago, um, I kept hearing the name of that album coming up over and over. John Coltrane, Love Supreme, Love Supreme, Love Supreme. But finally, one day, I just bought it. Okay? 
and I, w I was just really, just like, like really eager to listen to this. So I put the CD in the CD player, and I sat down, just, just ready, and, 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 and just, oh, I couldn't wait. And I played it. And at the end of it, I thought, really? That's it? That's weird. Because it's, it's, it's a challenging piece of music, right? It's, 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 it's kind of odd. Um, but the more I listened to it, the more it made sense. And every time I listen to it now, I actually listen to it on the way over here from, uh, from home. Um, every time I listen to it, I am drawn into the worship of God along with Mr. Coltrane. Now, this album has only four songs. Um, it lasts only 33 minutes. But it tells a story of how we come to know God through our experience. We come, we, we meet with God, we know who he is, we come to know who he is, but we still want our own way, don't we? Right? And there's this, this back and forth struggle between wanting the Almighty, wanting God, and then, and then pulling back and wanting our own way because we're naturally selfish. But then we realize that it doesn't work on our own. When we come to ourselves, yeah? But it does work when we go back to God. We accept his love. We accept his forgiveness. And God accepts that struggle. As long as we are interacting with him, as long as we're coming to God with an open, honest heart, he will make himself known to us. Won't he? And so this, this album portrays the despair that sometimes we feel as well as the unutterable joy, just like, like Chris was talking about earlier, that we have when we commune wholly, wholeheartedly with God. And it ends with this dramatic rumbling of drums and, um, and this hushed, reverent wail of Coltrane's saxophone as he pours out his heart, his soul, his mind, his strength. His very being, he pours it out to God. It is an amazing piece of work. You're probably thinking, okay, so play a little bit, right? Yeah. It's one thing to talk about music. It's something else to listen to. You want to hear a little bit? Yeah? Okay. So, again, it's, it's, it's challenging music. Um, I'm just going to play about a minute or two of it, of the, the last song. It's a track that Coltrane called simply Soul, right? And he also wrote a poem to go along with it, okay? Um, and as you listen to this, read the words on the screen, and you'll notice that the sound of Coltrane's saxophone, the cadence of the saxophone, is actually the voice of the words you're going to see. Okay? So John Coltrane, a love supreme. But you know what? What a love supreme reminds me every time I listen to it is that my life cannot be compartmentalized. My life cannot be compartmentalized. I'm either all out for God, everything, or I'm not. There's no middle ground. There's no me ground. So just like my John Coltrane devoted his art to God after his spiritual awakening in 1957, I have to devote my all to God, or else I am just going through emotions. Yeah? You know, Paul wrote about this in a verse that we've, we've used here at North Hills many times, um, but it's one that, that I find challenges me every single time I read it. Romans 12, 1 to 2. Now, in, in the versions I read when I was growing up, um, the, the key phrase that Paul uses is a living sacrifice, right? Whether it's the NIV or King James. And I, I, I guess I always just sort of glossed over that phrase um, because to my mind, sacrifice, it's something bloody, it's violent, it's irrelevant to the modern world. The ASPCA would not like this. You know, sacrifices, eh. But listen to this more modern take on it. So here's what I want you to do. God helping you, of course. Take your everyday, ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, walking around life, and place it before God 
as an offering. <clears throat> Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for him. Don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You will be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what he wants from you and quickly respond to it, unlike the culture all around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity. God brings the best out of you, develop, develops a well-formed maturity in you. So there's, there's, there's no Saturday or Sunday Christianity here, Paul is saying, right? Every aspect of your life, every aspect must be be devoted to God. <clears throat> Excuse me. All of it, right? This is what loving God is all about. This is a love supreme. <clears throat> but you know, it, it, it just seems too big, right? Too abstract. I mean, all? Everything? Not everything relates to our, our spiritual lives, right? I mean, washing the dog, going to birthday parties, reading the morning paper, that's, that, that, that's separate from the Christian life, right? I mean, we don't want to over-spiritualize things. That can be dangerous. Or, or, or is Paul just kidding when he instructs us to take our everyday life and place it before God as an offering? You know, the older I get, and... Um, the more I think about this, uh, the more I think that Paul is not kidding. Paul's not messing around. You know, the more I think that instead of risking over spiritualization, I think that we as Christians and we as Adventists in particular, we under spiritualize our lives. We compartmentalize our lives into sacred and secular, especially with the day on which we worship, when God is telling us, "Stop." It's all sacred. Your life, all of it, belongs to me. <clears throat> Dutch theologian Abraham Kuyper put it this way. There is not a square inch in the whole domain of our human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not cry, Mine! Mine! So what does this mean? What does this look like? How do we show our love supreme for God? And I've, I've probably talked enough here. Teachers do that. I'm sorry. Um, but what I want to do instead in the remaining time that we've got is to just give you some food for thought, um, something to dwell on over the next few days, next few weeks, as you think about your relationship to God. So I'm going to propose five areas, five everyday life areas, like Paul talked about, in which we have the opportunity to show God that he is truly first and foremost and supreme in our lives. So how, how you and I think about and, and, and operate in these areas um, says more about our relationship to God than any list of rules of do or don't ever could. They're about what matters to us on a basic, fundamental level. And they're things that we deal with every single day. Yeah, you ready? Yeah, cool. So first of all, work, yeah? Or for those of you who are still in school, um, school, because that's you know, your work at this point in your lives. <coughs> um, are you just working for a paycheck? <coughs> Excuse me, a paycheck? Do, do you give it your all or do just enough to get by? Do you allow the mundane to get you down? Or do you do your work, do your job with gusto? Or how about the, the chores at home, like washing the dishes or taking out the trash? You know, all of this is everyday life, just like Paul was talking about. You know? um, and yet how we go about our work whether it's your place of employment or school or college or, or the necessary chores at home, all of that speaks volumes of how we view our lives. Whether we compartmentalize our lives into sacred and secular, 
or whether we see our work as an opportunity to tell God, you know, I'm doing this to the best of my ability because I love you. Paul says in Colossians 3.23, work willingly, willingly, key word, at whatever you do, as though you were working for the Lord rather than for people. In 2 Timothy 2, Paul instructs his, his pro, protege to work hard so you can present yourself to God and receive his approval. Be a good worker, one who does not need to be ashamed. Your life will be clean. and You will be ready for the master to use you for every good work. And you know, we could gloss over these, these passages um, by saying, well, okay, the first one, if you read it in context, because that's what scripture is all about, um, if you read it in, in context, Paul is talking to servants, right? He's talking to slaves. Um, the second one, in Timothy, you know, he's talking to a pastor. Most of us are not pastors. So, you know, you're misusing that. But here's the thing. If we are Christians, if we call Jesus Lord and Master, check it out. We are servants, are we not? Yeah? And Paul doesn't really specify what kind of work is being done here. He says, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart. You know, our, our, our work is not our own. It's an opportunity given to us by God to honor him. It's not just a way to pay the bills. So when you wash the dishes, here's just a sub suggestion. When you wash the dishes, thank God that you just had a meal. There are literally billions of people on the planet today who will not have even that, right? Thank God that you just had a meal. Ask him to bless the hands that just prepared it. When you wash the dog, thank God for creating your little furry companions. Right? When you're studying for a test, all you students, let God know that you're going to give it your very best to make him proud. How we work is a part of our love supreme. Yeah, you with me? Right on. Or second, how about our relationships? Yeah? <clears throat> so it's been suggested that when the Bible says that we are created in the image of God, it refers to the fact that God is capable of and values relationship. And if our relationships are valuable to God, human to God as well as human to human, then it, it follows that our relationships themselves are an avenue to show our supreme love for God. Let me ask you, do, you, do you consecrate your relationships to God? Your friendships? Do you choose your friends wisely? Or how do you treat others, whether they're your friends, your co-workers, the server at the restaurant, maybe the guy who mows your lawn? With whom do we associate ourselves? Do we discriminate? You know, and, and, and by that, I don't mean, you know, are we racist? Are we sexist? Uh, I don't think anybody in here would raise their hands if I asked if you're in that, that category. No, you see, we have other more subtle ways to discriminate, don't we? Right? Like, how about the people who just annoy you? You know those people. The people who get in the, the, the express lane at the supermarket with more than 15 items. Yeah, those people, right? They're our brothers and sisters, aren't they? We are in a sort of relationship with them, aren't they? How about the people who annoy you, right? How about the people who talk too much or just go on and on about totally inane topics? I know someone like this at work. She drives me nuts. How about people from different socioeconomic classes? Do you avoid people in those categories? You know, I, I've, I've wondered sometimes if um, one of the reasons that I haven't participated as much in Sabbath way activities very often is because I'm uncomfortable being with people who are not like me. I'll be honest with you. Do you find ways to make sure that you converse only with people who look like you or people who have the same ambitions as you? Who do you associate with on a consistent basis? 
know, if, if, if you're honest with yourself and you acknowledge that you do make distinctions in how you relate to people, then you have to stop. You have to remind yourself that those people matter as much to God as you and I do. Don't they? Therefore, we have to love them. We have to see them as God's children. And so I personally need to make an effort to get to know these people. You know, and, and, and when I do, I am showing God that I love him and I take seriously his commandment to love others as I love myself. Or how about our families, right? I see a lot of families in here. North Hills is known for good, strong families. Um, are they simply biological extensions? Or are they sacred to God? Yeah, even that sister, that brother-in-law, that cousin, you know the one I'm talking about. The one that nobody likes, the one everybody wants to avoid at family reunions. Yeah, them too. Relationships. How we deal with people speaks volumes of how we deal with God. Yeah, you with me? Right on. Third, money. Yeah, the green stuff. Although I'm, I'm kind of disappointed at our money these days. It's not green anymore. You ever notice that? Yeah, it's odd. So anyway, that stuff, money. It's, it's a touchy subject, and um, I won't go into a lot of detail here. I'm running short on time anyway. So I'll leave this between you and God. But how we spend our money is another opportunity for us to show our love supreme for God. Because Jesus himself said, wherever your treasure is, there, what? There the desires of your heart will be, the stuff that you like. That's your treasure, right? And this, this isn't on your screen or in your bulletin because I like, had a revelation yesterday. Um, but just take a few minutes sometime to read the story of Zacchaeus in Luke 19. We all know the story of Zacchaeus. Yes, I know I could portray him in the movie. Yeah, okay, you're with me. Cool. Uh, um, but, you know, here, here, and so you, you know the story, right? Um, here was a guy who, who loved money. He loved what he could do with it. Um, and when he met Jesus, Zacchaeus, bam, he was changed, right? And, and he, he devoted his income, he devoted his portfolio to helping others, to serving God. And what did Jesus say that day? Do you know what it says in the story? You ever picked up on this? Jesus said to Zacchaeus, today salvation has come to this house because this guy is a son of Abraham. Salvation. Not kudos, not good vibes. Yeah, right on, man. Not pats on the back. Salvation. How we think about and use our money is a big deal to God. It's an eternal deal. Fourth, and this is something that I'm, I'm beginning to think about more and more these days, um, is our entertainment. Yeah? Um, this is another place where we, we compartmentalize our lives, isn't it? Right? We, we, we tend to dissociate our, our free time from our sacred time, but if, if it's true, as, as Kuiper said, if it's true that Jesus claims all of it, he claims all of our time, then free time and sacred time are not really as distinct as we like to think they are. Yeah? So what do you enjoy? You know, what, do you, what do you do for fun? Is it just fun? Is it just a, a, a temporary diversion? Or can your free time, can your entertainment be more than just a diversion? You know, sometimes um, entertainment is about more than just just entertainment. It's about something deeper. It's, it's about the things, the ideas that we cherish, the things we value. Take the example of baseball. Yeah? Okay. Now, you know, we can say that baseball is just a sport. It's just a way for people to show off their athleticism, of which I have none. Um, it's a way for Clayton Kershaw to make 30 million bucks a year. He's amazing. All right, he is. I'm jealous. Um, but, you know, if you look at the history of baseball, you realize very quickly that the sport itself mirrors 
things and larger issues that are happening in our society, right? Uh, just, just look at the fact that from the late 19th century up until the mid-20th century, until 1947, black men were not allowed to play in the major leagues, right? Um, not until the general manager of the Brooklyn Dodgers, a guy named Branch Rickey, he decided in 1947 uh, to do the right thing and break the barriers of race in the major leagues by putting a guy named Jackie Robinson into the lineup. Right? Now, Robinson was not accepted by many Americans. He was not accepted by Brooklyn fans even, right? Um, but Branch Rickey and the shortstop for the Dodgers, a southerner, by the way, a guy named Pee Wee Reese, they realized that this is something bigger than just themselves. You see, baseball wasn't just about a game. Right? It's about how we view people. It's about the attitudes that we maintain, the attitudes we express publicly. And so Branch Rickey and Jackie Robinson helped change the attitudes of an entire country, all through a form of entertainment. Yeah? So I, I, I encourage you to think about what your entertainment says about you and about your relationship to God. Do you praise God for giving talent and skill to the artists that you enjoy? Are you in awe of Le LeBron James's skill on the basketball court? Or are you in awe of the God who made LeBron James? Do you watch movies that you'd be ashamed of if Jesus walked in the room? Do, do you go on vacations just to get away from it all or to experience more of the world that you know God created? So how can your choices of en entertainment be a way of honoring God and inviting him into every aspect of your life? And finally, time. Time. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, time. It's created by God given to us by God. So is it ours or is it his? See, if, if our lives are dedicated to God, then I submit that all time is sacred time. Yes, you know, Sabbath is special, right? I, I, I don't deny that. I don't denigrate that. Don't downplay that. But, you know, the minute that we place Sabbath over anything else, including how we think about time, and we are denying God the chance to use us in every period of our lives, aren't we? So this, this actually became very clear to me um, a couple of years ago when I was reading the story of Jesus healing a guy with a withered hand on Sabbath. And you can find that in Mark 3 and, and Luke 6. And the story is essentially this. You probably know this. Um, the do-gooders, right, the ones who knew their re religion inside and out, and supposedly lived it out, they baited Jesus into breaking the law. These do-gooders, they, they thought that Sabbath time is so special, so sacred, that certain behavior, certain acts were not permissible, such as healing a man with a deformed hand. And so here's Jesus. I can, I can just see him. Here's the creator of the universe, and he's standing in front of his creation, and he's looking at, at the smirks on their faces. And what does he say to them? See, if it were me, I would lambast them. I would tell them they're a bunch of jerks, to put it mildly, right? It was the synagogue after all, I get that, right? Um, but what does Jesus do? He asks them a rhetorical question, right? Does the law permit good deeds on the Sabbath, or is it a day for doing evil? Is this a day to save life or to destroy it? Now, obviously, you know, we, we know this. We know that it's a day for doing good. It's a day for saving life. And so what does Jesus do? He heals the man, right? Yeah? He heals the man. Now, you know, I had read 
that story dozens of times. Right? I always nodded and smiled and thought, you know, Jesus is pretty cool. He showed up, those guys, those religious leaders, and he, he healed the guy. That's cool. That's great. You know? But a couple of years ago, it, it, it struck me. I think there's more going on here. And I think it has everything to do with that rhetorical question itself. Now, if you if you know anything about logic, you can you can do the logic with Jesus' question. Does the law permit good deeds on Sabbath? Yes, of course it does, right? But then we stop there, don't we? Because it's a rhetorical question. But think about this for the inverse. Okay? Is Sabbath the only day to do good deeds? All right, you're with me. All right, so, so if, if good deeds are sanctioned by God on Sabbath and the other six days of the week, well, then in a way you could almost make the case that, and hear me out, you could almost make the case that every day, in a way, is Sabbath. Yeah? In the sense that every day is sacred to God. Every day is right and proper for honoring for praising, for worshiping God. And this is precisely what Terry's been talking about for years, about the Sabbath way. Yeah? It's right there in Jesus' question. Right there in that story. Time. It's another four-letter word, a good one. And it belongs to God. Kuiper, once again. There's not a square inch in the whole domain of our human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not cry, mine. Our time does not belong to us. It's God's. And how we use it, how we spend it, speaks volumes of how we think of God. How we spend every moment of our time is a testament to our love for God. Yeah? So as the music team comes up, um, I just want to ask you, you know, what, what will be your response? Because I'll be honest with you, this challenges me. My own sermon here challenges me. Because I'm not good at this. Everything, all total supreme, really? That's bigger than just one day a week. That's bigger than some law code. It's tough for me. So what will be your response? Do you love God supremely? Do you love God above everything else? How will you show your love for God? Will you settle for business as usual? Or will you give it your all in every aspect of your life, as challenging and as consuming as that might be, in showing God that he is your love supreme.